Um, there's basically four major packers in the country that do eight out of ten animals in the, in the country. Even if it says USA on it, that doesn't mean it's actually from the USA anymore. That just means that they packaged it here. So it We're talking about a ten million dollar chunk of money that's invested into the meat processing side, that's invested into the restaurants, the ability to get that meat to the customer. It's a lot of our beef. Much of the stuff that comes from like Walmart or something like that, who knows, a lot of it comes from Brazil now. Oh, horseradish mayo, that sounds fantastic. Look at that, I gotta show this thing. This is not your everyday average burger here. In the United States, we've been conditioned to find and buy the cheapest product available. And what that means is when we buy beef is that we're usually buying beef that's not even from this country out of a big box store and we have no idea how it's raised, where it was raised, how it was taken care of during butchering, any of that. Well, there's a one rancher right here in Helena, Montana, who is taking a $10 million gamble that you care more for community than a cheap price at a big box store. So let's meet Cole Mannix and see how he's attempting to change the way that the beef gets from right here in this pasture to your plate. So Cole, um, you're creating a way, or you're changing the way that your family raises beef and sells beef, I guess, to the end consumer, correct? Yeah, so we got together with other ranches that share our values, which is basically let's manage these landscapes intact on into future generations. Let's care about soil and water and wildlife habitat. So intact ecosystems. We love these wide open wild landscapes. And being a commodity producer means that you raise a calf or you raise a yearling and then you sell, sell that animal to somebody else who brings it to market, meaning bring it to market weight. They finish it, they background it, whatever they do to get that animal harvest ready. So they take it from the rancher and they feed it grain or corn or whatever until it's fat to where what age? So the, the right. rancher so, keeps it until... Yeah, so a typical ranch will sell a calf at six to eight months of age or they'll keep that animal as a yearling and sell it the next year. But that animal that's a yearling still has, you know, it's gotta be 30 months of age by the time it's processed or a little bit younger, 20, let's say 24 to 30 months of age. And so Old Salt is basically working with ranches to bring them to finish weight here in Montana without leaving the state and then to actually do the processing. So Old Salt has raised the money to um, build out plants that can be USDA compatible. So a slaughter facility and then after you slaughter the animal and then chill the carcass down, you begin fabricating the carcass, meaning you cut the meat off of the bone package the meat how you're going to package it and get it ready to be shipped whether that's going in the mail to a customer or whether it's going to a restaurant um, or whether we also deliver on, deliver on a delivery route so once one Saturday we'll drive to Helena and Bozeman and Butte and another Saturday we'll go to Missoula and the Flathead and we'll just meet people who have ordered their meat online in a parking lot and they get their meat that way and so what we're really trying to do is just to build a relationship with customers that we've never had before because we're used to just producing that calf or that yearling and then never seeing it again. And the people who buy it in the same way, they, they know nothing about its origin. They know nothing about what the land behind the product looked like. They know nothing about how the animals were treated, nothing about how we treat our workers. Um, but we're, we're just basically interested in our neighbors knowing us and us knowing our neighbors better and having an opportunity to have that connection that is lost when food becomes just a commodity where you search for it at the lowest price you possibly can. Um, there's basically four major packers in the country that do eight out of 10 animals in the, in the country on the beef side of things. And so it's, that's a fairly, uh, those are very large companies that do the majority of the work there. And then those companies sell to a distributor, think of US Foods or think of Cisco. And then that distributor then sells to the major retailers where it ultimately ends up getting to most people's plates whether that retailer is a grocery store like Safeway or whether the retailer is a restaurant chain, you know, like a Chipotle or a McDonald's, etc. Well, something that you're doing is is very important to bring back a realization of where your food is actually be coming from, right? You don't see the process in what you're talking about. It's so out there. Yeah, I, I think um, just, just knowing the various people that are in the supply chain, um, even, I mean, I think we all know what a grocery store, we all know what a restaurant is, but 
you know, in this day and age, we probably don't really know our grocer. <laughs> and we right. probably don't, we often don't know the restaurant owner. And if you buy your, your meat at a grocery store, 30 years ago in the 1980s, you would have been buying from a team of butchers at that grocery store that received those carcasses on the bone in their facility, fabricated it themselves, know where those carcasses came from, and they can cut things to your spec. But those grocery stores have basically gone from being a, a butcher shop you know, within a larger store to now basically just a repository to place meat out on the shelf. They get it pre-cut, the meat comes in boxes from major beef plants, and you've basically just, those grocery stores, because they just get the meat already cut, they don't employ a butchery team. And so the customer that used to interact with that product through butchers now interacts with it through labels, mm -hmm. which is a fair, uh, it's a fair bit more anonymous Oh, a lot, man. Um, yeah. How much of the beef in the in Montana comes from Montana? It's a it's imperfect to get your head around this stat, but something like six million dollars of four hundred and twenty eight million dollars of meat eaten in Montana actually could verifiably be traced to Montana. It's kind of amazing to think when you that's think astounding. about how many cattle are here. I don't, what percent is that? That's a, it's almost nothing. It's, it's a percent and a half. And with a thing like Old Salt, for a reason. We don't ever want to get to a scale where we lose an intimacy with the customer. We want to be able to get our head around it, and we want them to be able to get their head around us. Like, oh, they're based in Helena. Their ranches are in Helmville and Cascade and Melville and the Centennial Valley. I can point to those landscapes. I've driven through them to recreate or you know, to fish or to visit a friend um, or just on my you know, way from one Montana city to the other. That's a real connection because you can drive through the Blackfoot Valley and make a, an informed decision about whether you think that ecosystem is intact or not. Mm -hmm. Doing this actually promotes the ranchers that are around here, right? The ranchers that are in your local area because they're the ones that are going to be contributing down the road to their own profit if they can utilize it in that way um, for selling their beef direct, more directly to the customers, having maybe an ownership in Old Salt is the company that he's, he's building. And so why is it important, do you think, th that we keep our ranches, our family ranches intact in Montana and the West? I mean, I think people who live in Montana already, similar to people who are moving here now, they move here because it's wide open, beautiful landscapes, wildlife habitat. You know, it offers a lot of things that are gone in the rest of the world. And two thirds of the state is private rather than public. Mm -hmm. The lands that were settled and became private tend to be those lands that are richest in water, have the richest soils, and so not just domestic animals, but wildlife depend on those landscapes in a huge way. And so if we care about the future of this landscape, even if we don't really care, so, even if we don't eat a lot of meat, then ranching is a very critical industry. And you know, it just so happens that ranching can utilize grass that is growing out there naturally and is generally not very suitable to farm ground. Mm -hmm. They can turn that into an incredibly nourishing product, which is meat, and yet not take up all the resources that wildlife also need to make a living. And so it's this place where wildness and productive agriculture can coexist. That to me is kind of the holy grail. It's like we can have our cake and eat it too from the perspectives of wildness, big open landscapes, and yet still economic activity, jobs, you know, good food. I would say ranchers, doing by doing what they do normally, just raising beef, they are actually protecting lands from development, whether they mean to or not, right? When, when a ranch is sold, and a lot of times people say, well, ranchers are all rich, right? Well, they are in a way, absolutely, I believe they are. They're rich in assets, not cash. So it's very hard to live off an asset if it doesn't produce cash. So what the ranchers are actually living on is what they can make from their cattle. And that those margins there are then very important because they produce a way of life that either the children of that ranch want to come back to or they don't. A lot of our beef, much of the stuff that comes from like Walmart or something like that, who knows, a lot of it comes from Brazil now. Uh, we were, I was looking at staggering numbers yesterday of how much beef comes from Brazil for the U.S. So when you buy beef in the supermarket, you're not sure where that's coming from. Uh, I learned uh, a couple weeks ago, even if it says USA on it, that doesn't mean it's actually from the USA anymore. That just means that they packaged it here. So it could be from anywhere, 
processed and then brought here and packaged with somebody's package on it, put it in the grocery store, and it says U.S. I just think doing business with each other kind of forces us to have real relationships. And I do think that is part of meaning and part of kind of combating the loneliness that when we're just commodity cogs on a wheel and yep. produce a product that we never see the end of that process. We never see the beginning or the end. I mean, it's just like yeah, it's, half the time. It's kind of the ultimate fragmentation. It, yes. You might get products and you might get them as cheaply as you could possibly get them, but you lose all the things that are meaningful in the middle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and yeah. Some of those things are very, very tangible, like fertility, soil health, <laughs> mm -hmm. water. But other other things are less tangible, like loneliness, like mm -hmm. a connection right. to why you do what you do. That's and I would even say like a responsibility for where, when you, that's why people hunt sometimes, is like when you take responsibility for the, the meat you're eating, you're taking responsibility because you're understanding the reality of life by doing that. And so when you buy beef from out of sight, out of mind, completely, you're not connected to in any way or responsible in any way for how that was managed, right? But when you see it, you have to take some ownership of like, and it, and it actually feels good yeah. to take some ownership of like, I'm buying this beef because I know where it came from. I know the guys that raised it. I know who butchered it. I know where, how it got, you know, I know the people that work there. It's like a, I would say a sense of, the sense of, um, empowerment. It's like you empowerment. take control over Exactly. A sense of empowerment. Is, in the world. Yeah. So how much is this going to cost you to, to take this risk because of all that? Because you have to get USDA inspected. You can't just sell beef directly that's cut and wrapped to a customer without having it uh, inspected by the USDA. They've made it a very, very hard thing to do where only the huge companies with lots of money can really get into this. So it's costing you a lot. What it, What's that going to take? Yeah, I mean, so you got to start with an idea of the, the kind of scale we're trying to achieve. And so our goal is right now, we're starting from a place of the ranches that are involved in Old Salt. There's currently four with hopefully more to come. They sell um, about 600 animals locally each year out of thousands that they, ra that they raise and sell commodity. Gotcha. So that's mm -hmm. less than 10% of their overall production. And our goal by 2028 is what if we could sell 2,000 head of livestock that we turn into meat here and we sell to Montana customers. So to achieve that goal, we're talking about a $10 million chunk of money that's invested into the meat processing side, that's invested into the restaurants, the ability to get that meat to the customer, to organize all the infrastructure it takes to get food from where it's raised in a field to your plate. And so that's a scary investment to make. Mm -hmm. No Montana bank would, would, would fund us uh, unless the ranchers put up their ranches against the loans. And because Which would be so, even a bigger risk. <laughs> and the, these, these families, that their, their whole goal is oh, yeah. not to ever sell that land. Their, their right. whole goal is to continue trying to be a steward of land and live in a place that they love. That's what they're good at. Um, and so they're, you know, it's, we've created this system where there's just not a lot of regional food infrastructure. To rebuild that is risky. The banks, in order to take a risk on that kind of financing, are going to require the land. They're going to require hard assets. And the ranches can't take that whole rebuilding of the food risk onto themselves. They've, and that, that requires creative financing. We have a small butcher plant, but oh, you do? Uh, we don't have the slaughter facility yet. Okay, So gotcha. that's what we're building. And then we're renovating the butcher plant to be able to accommodate the federal inspection. Yeah, we actually can sell directly to customers right now. Um, what has to happen is that we send them elsewhere to get slaughtered under inspection. Uh -huh. So I, we've done that in Lewistown and we've done that in uh, Big Timber. Uh, and then we can bring that carcass back to the little plant we have, fabricate it, sell it online, sell it through our own restaurants. But in order to sell it to somebody else who resells it, gotcha. so in order for me to sell it to another restaurant, that's where USDA inspection becomes necessary. We'll eventually, our, our little plant will process for other ranches and farms outside of Old Salt that have their own brands. And if they want to sell it to third party customers, then they'll also need us to have USDA inspection. You know, we saw during COVID that that system can break. So pl people, plants in a, or people in a plant. A lot quicker than we thought. 3,000 or 6,000 a head a day. Right. Those workers get COVID and all of a sudden there's nowhere to process those animals. There's not alternatives. Because the other plants, if they don't have COVID, they're full. Mm -hmm. And so there's no place to bring a market ready animal. So having redundancy, meaning just lots more medium sized plants rather than a few huge ones makes sense to me. Absolutely. 
redundancy not only in the packing but in the distribution um, and and again like I think you live in a better community when you have more options to eat out mm -hmm. and so there's redundancy in like who are the people that are preparing this and selling it like those are the things that add flavor to a place and then we also do all the processing for our restaurant uh, right out of here all the processing for the meat that we sell online out of here so that's where the uh, cutting of, of meat off of the bone that will have a little bit of aging uh, of the carcass here we'll cut the meat off of the bone package and uh, be able to sell commercially with that USDA certification the carcasses will come here from a slaughter facility that's about five miles away in Jefferson County near East Helena okay so the carcasses will come here be fabricated boxed and ready for market we're living on this tiny little three quarters of an acre property at the moment we've got a catering vehicle that came with a restaurant that we just purchased and are renovating. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. But uh, yeah, we're all, all of our employees are basically in one 1,000 square foot building at the moment here. Oh. I can introduce you to the crew. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, John, what's going on? We're in the plant here. This is Johnny Mansani. So Johnny does all kinds of things around the plant, but he's scheduling livestock into when they're gonna be processed and he's working with our customers to make sure they get their product and then he traces the product all the way from the carcass in, into the box so that we know what ranch it all came from. And so That's very important, right? Yeah. Yeah, and traceability <laughs> is important. Yeah. yeah, so how do you trace that and what's the... We use Vistatrack. Uh, it's a system that when the animals come in and prints out a carcass tag, gives that a specific serial number. Um, once we have that serial number, it it hangs up in the cooler for as many days as we need it. We activate it. Uh, when we print the meat out, there's additional labels that tie it to that serial number. And then when we're boxing it up, we can also label that. So um, okay. from step one to the very end, that's being tracked by serial numbers, everything all in turn. Jason is our foreman at the plant. Okay. Um, he grew up in, uh, in agriculture, not too far from you and Conrad, but near Shelby. Yeah. And has... Conrad Cowboy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Well, well I'm, I'm from Sunburst. Oh, from Sunburst, so yeah. way up by the border, huh? Sunburst Refiner. Uh-huh. Yeah. My family has 10,000 acres up there that my great-grandpa homesteaded in 1910. Okay. A farm? Yeah, farm, farm and ranch. Man. And then when I was in high school, freshman in high school, my dad and my uncles, they bought a USDA slaughterhouse in Shelby. Oh. And so that's how I got into it. It was my summer job. And then... Uh, once you get in the meat business, you don't get out. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it's like the mafia. <laughs> so, so what are you making, Jason? I'm toasting spices. Making here? Toast and fennel for the Italian sausage. For the Italian sausage? Yeah, okay. so we toast it, and then I'll let it cool down, and then I'll grind it. Of course, grind it so it's not all fine. Still get some fennel seed in there. And this is this is for the restaurant, or? Uh, this is for custom sausage. Oh, okay, custom sausage. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I just toasted the black pepper. That's in the freezer, cooling down right now. And I'm just trying not to let this burn here. It's pretty much yep. done. It smells good too. Yes, it does. <laughs> Especially since, while well, it's cooking, it's really, really good, doesn't it? Yeah. And then Jelena has been helping us in the meat processing stuff also at the Outpost restaurant for uh, okay. probably She's helping a, over there too. a year and a half now. And um, once, we, once we get her back out of the freezer, I ask yeah. her to share a little bit about <laughs> I came to pick meat up here for a barbecue we were doing. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. For just a, some yeah, neighbor, neighborhood I'm thing? Or? Because it's it's Montanans. It's it's the meat from Montana. And, like, I just want to make sure it gets back to people who care about it. I think the, the more that we feed them good food down at the outpost, the more we'll be able to be busy here. So, yeah. mm -hmm. <laughs> so you work down at the outpost restaurant, too, sometimes? What, what do you do down there? I prep sometimes, and I do customer orders. Okay. Mm -hmm. Cool. They support the outpost by helping roll patties and getting that ready. The outpost goes through something like six to seven hundred pounds of burger a week. So there's a lot of that to be ready each week. All the products we sell online and sausages, he was talking about the fennel sausages. Um, we've got like five flavors of that to, to liver pate where we mix mangalitsa hog fat with beef liver. To, so uh, is that is that the stuff that I tried at the yeah. At the ranch? Yeah, because try the pate. And, and it's pate? Yep. yep. Uh, so I, I always thought of pate as something to be completely disgusting, but it was <laughs> it was amazing. Amazing tasting. Yep, they do that right in here. So what's so. your website? Uh, OldSaltCoop.com. So right so. now, I mean, you're got, you guys are at the stage in this 
business of of just starting i mean you're trying to, you're getting to the yeah. you've got some of the financing figured out you're trying to get the usda inspected and everything so it's it's you know these things are a process of of and it, yeah. everybody expects them to go really quickly and they never do especially no, when you have to do with government three years ago three years ago mm -hmm. and you know you first of all all the initial kind of ideation and, and business plan writing and then the talking with the, the core group that wants to found it and help create it and all the the calls and the meetings to say well just what should it feel like and and uh, how would, how should we structure it and all the legal documents to set up the entity in the right way um, so that you can maintain governance where you want to maintain it and so that you can attract investors and so that you can receive the financing that you will need right um, and so and then just all the business planning and projections that you need to have an idea of how is this going to perform once it's all running and so now here we are we have a couple of years of experience now operating our first restaurant a year of experience operating this little processing plant we're about to launch a new restaurant that's currently being renovated and all the planning going into it um, should launch in maybe January and that's and bigger yeah it's it's a 7,000 square foot restaurant that will be blending a butcher shop with a charcoal fire grill all of all of it featuring featuring local meat okay and um, it'll be called the Union in downtown Helena right across from our current outpost restaurant is that the old Burton Ernie's yeah it used to be Burton Ernie's and the the gentleman who ran Burton Ernie's for many years his family had the last uh, kind of local butcher shop in Helena closed down in the 1980s, I think 1989. Oh, okay. Uh, the DeWolf family, and they that was called the Union Market, so we're bringing back the Union. I see. Inspection. For USDA inspection will probably be around February, is my guess. Right around February, yeah. okay. Yeah, so when you're starting a business like this, you, you have this huge risk involved in the, the amount of money you're spending, and then you have to be able to build the infrastructure fast enough to where you can start selling to customers or you can't get any of that back, right? So it's kind of a race to that. What you mean by a race is like, it's got to get to the point where it can actually sell something to a customer. And at that point, you can begin to go towards black anyway. Yeah, you can. <laughs> For, up until then, you're just going backwards. So Yeah, the goal is to be able to pay your employees and pay your bank note. Right. And uh, have enough left over to um, begin to, you know, hey, we need a blast freezer that's a little bit better than the existing freezer. And right. to start replacing all the equipment that eventually does need to be replaced after it kind of depreciates and wears out. That's right. And the cool thing is that five years down the road, if the company is profitable, ultimately the ranch is sharing that. In right. the meantime, there's all these other important things. Just the reward of seeing how much Helena loves the outpost. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this first restaurant we did, it, it is hugely rewarding. And it, just that by itself has been all worth it. <laughs> cool. Uh, cool. So there's, there's a lot of fun elements along the way. It's not only just waiting till someday it's, it's going to feel perfect. Like it's never perfect. You're always going to be making tweaks and addressing new challenges, but it's been uh, just a very meaningful and fun ride in the first few years. I will go with the uh, the double cheeseburger and potatoes, potatoes. you said? Yeah. Oh, horseradish mayo, that sounds fantastic. Yeah. Can what I also do with? a double of potatoes with burger sauce? Yes, please. What's the burger sauce? It's like a like a sriracha and mayo oh. and uh, ketchup. Of course, it'll be right out. All right, appreciate it. At the Kleppner side, I mean, it's really just bank. Thank Thanks, Emily. Um, so you call these just potatoes? They're kind of like a, them beef fried potato, a JoJo or something. But yeah, they're just they're potatoes that are good. boiled in salt and broken into little chunks, uneven chunks, so that you've got a lot of surface area. And then we yeah. fry them in beef towel. Okay. 
Like McDonald's used to do. Good thing? Yeah. Huh. That's what that makes what's what makes something fried delicious and good. No kidding. This is look at that. I gotta show this thing. This is not your everyday average burger here. Now this beef came from your ranch then? That's right. Mm. Wow. Well, whatever, whatever you put in the burger, that's fantastic. Mm. That needs nothing. Hey, thank you so much, Cole. Thank you. Appreciate I, it. I enjoyed it. Yeah, it was fantastic. I appreciate so you taking the time. Hopefully, we. Yeah, absolutely. It's a. Uh, you know, my goal, part of my goal is to bring people to the realization, to really help educate people about where their food comes from, why it's important that we do this kind of thing, yep. right? Why it's important that we do help our local ranches sell to customers right here yep. and that they know where your food comes from, so. Amen to that. All right. See Sounds good. See ya. Take care.